Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiri O'Reilly Wilkes, and I'm a board member at St. Michael's Hospital Foundation. I'm also a mom with a child whose life was saved by the amazing people at St. Michael's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. Welcome to What to Expect When You're Expecting During a Pandemic. I'm so glad that you're all joining us today. I went into the hospital with some back pain during my pregnancy back in 2014 and was told I'd have to deliver my son Malachi that night or risk both of our lives. The NIC unit team at St. Michael's healed my baby and cared for both of us with such skill and compassion that I knew I had to get involved. And that's how our NIC unit fundraiser Malachi Soiree got started. Back then, of course, I didn't have the COVID-19 pandemic to worry about. These days, the prospect of giving birth during a pandemic is so worrying. I know you have lots of concerns and questions about how to keep yourself, your baby, and your family safe during this whole process. And we have the experts here to answer your questions and ease your fears. First, let me introduce our moderator, Dr. Tally Bogler who's Chair of Family Medicine Obstetrics at St. Michael's Hospital. She's an experienced family medicine obstetrics provider and a mom herself. She's also co-founder of the incredibly popular Pandemic Pregnancy Guide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tally Bogler. Thank you, Carrie, for that wonderful introduction. And similar to your story, I'm a mom. Um, of twins who also spend time with my twin girls in the NICU at St. Michael's Hospital. And I'm pleased to be here today to moderate this very important discussion. One of the reasons we started at Pandemic Pregnancy Guide, our Instagram account, and one of the main reasons we're here together as a panel is we know that being pregnant can be a very vulnerable time um, at the best of times, and especially for first time expecting parents. And then adding on COVID-19 and all the changes that have come with it and all the uncertainties, uh, we understand that this can lead to more anxiety and more uncertainty during this time. And this is why we're here. This is why we've come together. And we're really hoping to answer as many questions as possible that you and your extended family might have right now. So I'd first like to introduce our distinguished panel. First off, we have Dr. Doug Campbell. He's a pediatrician and neonatologist at St. Michael's Hospital and the director of our neonatal intensive care unit. He is also the deputy chief of pediatrics and the medical director of the Allen Waters Family Simulation Center at St. Michael's Hospital. So welcome, Dr. Campbell. Next, we have Dr. Philomena Mackey. She's the chief of OBGYN at St. Michael's Hospital. Welcome. And lastly, we have Dr. Julie Maggi. She is a staff psychiatrist with us at St. Michael's Mental Health Services and works in the perinatal mental health unit. We're grateful to have all of you here with us today. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping notes for today's discussion. So first of all, if you'd like to ask one of our panelists a question, just type it into the Q&A chat box um, on the bottom of your screen. We're gonna hold all of um, the questions to the end of our event. And at the end of our questions that I pose to our panelists, we're gonna try to go through as many questions as possible um, and, and I'll pose as many questions as possible to our speakers. If you experience any te technical difficulties at any point uh, during the talk, you can click on the, te the tech support or tech support chat at the bottom of your screen and one of our techs will help you. And then after the event, we're gonna send everyone a few survey questions. We'd be very grateful if you could take a moment um, to submit your answers. And lastly, our webinar today is recorded you'll receive the link to rewatch the session after the event. And we welcome you to revisit the content and share with your friends, family, and colleagues. So let's get started. So let's start with our first question. The impact of COVID-19 on pregnant women has been substantial. And since March 11th, uh, when the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic, knowledge about COVID-19 on pregnancy and infant outcomes has been rapidly evolving. And public health messaging has at times been contradictory, which can also lead to added stress for expectant parents. I think it would be really helpful for our viewers and followers today if 
Um, Dr. Uh, Doug Campbell and Dr. Philomena Meffi, if you could provide the most up-to-date information that we have as of today, knowing that information keeps on changing, but as of today, what do we know in terms of the medical risk of COVID-19 for one, the pregnant individual, to the fetus, so when uh, the woman's still pregnant on the fetus, and the neonate, once born, and babies in general. So maybe we'll start with Dr. Meffi, if you could start by highlighting um, the risks in pregnancy. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Tally, for that question, so important. As you've said yourself, when this pandemic first uh, started, I think that the sense was that uh, COVID-19 and pregnancy was not that much different uh, from uh, individuals who had COVID-19 and weren't pregnant. But as information has evolved and our, in, our understanding of this virus has evolved, we are uh, getting new evidence to show that actually uh, pregnant individuals may be uh, experiencing uh, more advanced symptoms and, and more complications than a non-pregnant individual. There may be more admissions uh, to hospital. There's more difficulty with breathing. Perhaps it, we're beginning to see that maybe it may be just like the flu, just like pregnant individuals may get more sick uh, if they have the flu compared to non-pregnant uh, individuals. So I think that's important to recognize. And what can make it even more uh, complex is when uh, individuals have other uh, medical problems such as diabetes or high blood pressure that can also make the symptoms um, uh, more advanced. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Very helpful. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. as for the pregnancy and the fetus, uh, I think it's, it's important for us to take this information seriously and to say, okay, we are going to monitor the pregnancy more carefully, we'll monitor the growth of the baby, the well-being of the baby more frequently because there, there have been reports of maybe an increased incidence of stillbirth. Um, and it, it, it's really important to take this into consideration and monitor the pregnancy more closely. And just a follow-up question to that, what I've seen a lot is, you know, if I'm pregnant, am I more at risk of actually acquiring COVID-19? So how would you answer that question? Well, what we know is that it, being pregnant doesn't necessarily make you at greater risk of contracting COVID-19. Uh, but if you do get COVID-19, there, there is new evidence showing that you, you may get sicker. Right, especially if you have those underlying yes. comorbidities, as you mentioned. Great, thank you. That's very informative. Um, I'm going to uh, transition over to Dr. Doug Campbell. So, what do we know about, um, you know, the term that we use a lot is vertical transmission. You know, if the pregnant woman were to um, get COVID-19, what impact do we know um, that could potentially have on the baby, or is there any impact? Yeah, so it's a great question, uh, Tally. And again, thanks for for hosting and having me here. It's great to be here with this panel. Um, I think what Dr. Meffe said is, is really quite true. Um, you know, we're, we're evolving in our understanding of this disease. We're evolving in, in our knowledge and what it means. And as, as I think our readers and an audience can understand, we're, we're just learning about it still in a way because it's only been about a year that we've had data and information uh, in order to, to really provide the, the optimal answer to all these questions. I think what we do know, thankfully, is that both the unborn baby and the baby themselves are not at high risk of getting COVID. Uh, and that's really, really important, I think, for our mothers to know, and, and hopefully very reassuring. This problem, uh, as it seems, although it's possible that the baby can get COVID, there have been reports that the baby can get, get COVID while being, or being exposed to COVID while the moms are pregnant, particularly late in the pregnancy, that seems to be a very rare occurrence. And so I think that's really, really important to know that even if you were unlucky enough to get COVID and you're pregnant, uh, the chances of your baby being exposed to the virus while you're pregnant is actually probably quite low. So it has happened uh, and we have to be careful. We need to learn about, you know, why would that happen? So it doesn't seem that there's a high risk. And in fact, it doesn't seem that at this point, as far as we know, that the fetus or that the unborn baby is at risk of problems being exposed to the virus. 
Right. And that's a big one because I think a lot of women have Zika at the back of their minds. And why is this different than Zika in terms of the first trimester potential congenital malformations? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. You know, even the Zika question is evolving uh, for the unborn baby. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's reasonable to be very cautious and, and, and somewhat um, scared, in fact, of getting a new virus when you're pregnant. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a different virus, first of all. Um, so it doesn't seem to be um, as dangerous to the developing brain as Zika has and the developing skull. Um, so that's really good news. Um, having said that, of course, you know, we probably need more data in order to understand the true risks. Um, if by looking at thousands, of, if not more women who are exposed while pregnant early in pregnancy. But right. thankfully, the risk is low and the unborn baby's risk is quite low. So and just to add one, one last thing before we run out of time for this question, um, in terms of uh, neonates in the, na in the neonatal period. So let's say the baby does contract uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. What are we seeing for the babies in that first month of life? So great question. Uh, so we do see some babies that seem to have the virus in their system uh, after being born to moms who have COVID. Um, and, and it's possible they got it from mom, but probably most of them didn't acquire it from mom. So that's the first thing. Uh, thankfully, these babies seem to tolerate the presence of the virus really, really well. Yeah. Uh, so most of them aren't sick, which is surprising at first, yeah. but it's really reassuring. And in fact, we strongly recommend breastfeeding, staying with the mom if mom's well, uh, encouraging skin to skin, all the normal baby care. And that's because babies seem to tolerate this exposure to this virus very well. Uh, and even if they did get it, they don't seem to be very sick from it. And that's extremely reassuring. Can they get sick? Yes, but it seems to be quite rare, uh, which I think is really, really important for our audience to be aware of. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I wanted you to touch upon. And I think that's extremely helpful for people to know. Okay, great. So let's move on to our next question. So it's certainly not pregnancy as usual during COVID-19. And one of the questions I've been seeing in my practice and on our Instagram account is, how do things look differently right now in terms of prenatal care, um, when it comes to delivering in the hospital, as well as the postpartum period for both mom and baby. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Mephi, can we touch upon prenatal care first and how that might look a little bit different during COVID-19? Yes, thanks, Tally. That's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, um, let me divide this up into low risk and high risk pregnancy, because I think that they are different in how we are managing things. Sure. So for the low risk pregnancy, what I will say is that uh, of course, COVID has forced us to uh, rearrange how we do things. We want to minimize um, crowding in the waiting rooms. We want to, minim you know, we want to enhance the, the physical distancing. And so uh, we've had to do things differently. So what we've done at uh, St. Mike's is that we have de decided on a schedule of visits that will still allow us to care for a pregnant individuals and monitor their pregnancy um, effectively, but at the same time, try to minimize some visits. So probably the number of visits that we do virtually and in clinic are about the same, but there will be uh, some visits where it will be done virtually because it's a check-in, how are you doing, is baby moving, but then there's other visits which are quite crucial for the patient to be in the clinic. They need an ultrasound. We have to do their diabetes testing. We require, um, you know, other kinds of testing that can only be done in person. So overall, um, the the number of visits are pretty much the same, but they're just at certain points done differently. In the high risk pregnancy group of women, most of those women or patients, pregnant individuals, are having to come in because their pregnancies are being monitored very closely for whatever the reason is. And so for those individuals, they're having to come in for most of their visits. So that's how the prenatal care looks like. But I want to assure everyone that the, the way visits are done are going to be tailored to their needs. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. Um, just along the same lines of uh, prenatal care, uh, what about having a partner at ultrasounds is a very common question that people have. 
and the usual stuff that people experience uh, previously to COVID-19 in terms of virtual tours of the hospital or prenatal classes, breastfeeding classes. How, how has that changed? Okay, well, you can imagine uh, what things were like when we had to shut down completely. We were doing prenatal classes in person, you know, pre in, in person prenatal classes, in person breastfeeding classes. And overnight, we had to shut everything down. And that was necessary because we were dealing with a new virus and we weren't quite sure how it was going to behave. Uh, slowly, and it took time, it took planning, but we have introduced uh, virtual prenatal classes that uh, individuals can sign up for. Mm -hmm. We had to introduce breastfeeding class or, or breastfeeding sessions on a virtual Virtually. basis. Mm -hmm. So we, it might have been slow to react, but it took a lot of planning to do that. Great. Um, Great. And there was another question you had, Tally. I, about I, having a, a lot of people are, yeah, we can talk about it at the end as well, but not, you know, there's restrictions in terms of having a support person for outpatient appointments. Um, and maybe we can actually leave that for a second, because I want to talk about labor and delivery, because the, the okay. topic about support person during pregnancy and labor and delivery comes up a lot. And I know that's on the minds of so many people. Um, so let's actually switch gears a little bit and talk about what it's like to deliver in hospital and specifically about the support person right now. Right. So we recognized right from the start how important it is for pregnant individuals to have a support person. We know that labor goes more smoothly when yes. that important support person is there. Uh, and um, so at our, uh, you know, St. Mike's, we recognize that right from the start and our essential care partner policy included uh, for every pregnant individual to have a support person come in with them at the time of labor and to stay for the entire admission. You have to understand that this is different from what other hospitals were doing. Uh, in, in some cases, partners have to leave within two hours of birth um, and we're not allowed to stay. So again, I mean, we were very sensitive to uh, the needs of our pregnant individuals and, and kind of allowed that right from the, uh, from the start. Okay, that's great. What else can you expect in terms of labor and delivery? What are some things that expecting parents might notice are different this time around or if you're a new parent? Well, you'll be screened when you come into the hospital, both you and, uh, you know, the your partner or essential care provider. Mm -hmm. There'll be a second screening done when you reach the labor and birth department. And this is so important to keep everyone safe. Um, and you will see our healthcare providers wearing uh, personal protective equipment. And, you know, sometimes that's hard. You don't see their faces. Uh, th that sets up a, another barrier, but people are trying so hard to be uh, as sensitive as possible to that. You'll see some of us wearing little buttons with our photographs on it so that you can actually see what we look like. Um, and so I think that we understand that that can create a bit of a barrier, but at the same time, we're trying our best to accommodate. When uh, patients come in, their, their essential care partner will be asked to stay in the room as much as possible. Again, it's for the safety of everyone else uh, around us as well. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest change. Everything else is business as usual. Agreed. Yes, <laughs> it's true. And I think um, for our followers that are watching this right now, we do have a wonderful video that uh, takes you through entering the hospital, the screening process, what the labor and delivery rooms look like. And I think it's a wonderful video just to orient yourself. It's essentially a virtual tour. We were doing these tours in person before COVID-19. Um, so in terms of the postpartum care, what I'm thinking we'll do is we'll actually leave that um, for when we speak to Dr. Maggi about uh, uh, perinatal health and postpartum supports. Maybe we'll just put that on pause for a second and move on to our third question, if that's okay. So this is a big one. And you know what, I think um, my fellow colleagues, they would probably agree that there's some themes that we're receiving in terms of all the questions from our patients and also some of the questions that we've received beforehand from our uh, viewers today. And one of the most common questions we've all been receiving is, what about family members? What about the grandparents in the postpartum period? Um, and I think this is something people are really struggling with uh, in terms of supports. 
and just, you know, looking forward to introducing the new baby to loved ones. I often hear some of my patients saying, how am I going to manage? This is, you know, potentially not the pregnancy I imagined and are sort of grieving that loss of what they had envisioned, especially around introducing their newborn to loved ones, which is, you know, one of the most joyous moments in a growing family's life. And, you know, for grandparents, especially, I can't think of an occasion more painful to miss out on than holding and bonding with their newborn grandchild. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn to Dr. Campbell to talk a little bit about this um, topic, which is near and dear to all of our hearts. And it's a tough one. Yeah. Thanks, Tally. I think it's a really important thing to consider. Again, I just want to stress that when you're thinking about whether it's your grandparents or other relatives or other supports, you know, every family will likely have a unique situation. And it's hard to develop a perfect answer cut out for everybody. Um, As you mentioned, family is an incredible resource and support source for these families and, and what is not only a happy time, but it can be exhausting. And when you leave hospital with your baby, um, most most women will tell us that they need that help. Um, So how do we do that safely? I I think, again, just remember the risk isn't so much to the baby here. So let's let's just refocus that the babies seem to be quite resilient. They don't seem to get this virus uh, very easily and uh, they don't seem to spread it easily. So really the focus, um, in my opinion, uh, should really be on who are you inviting into your house or your apartment or your condo, what have you, in order to support you? Are there situations uh, which are going to create different plans? Of course. So if you had grandparents that had uh, health conditions or were, were more elderly than other grandparents, that's an important consideration because I would hate to do something that would introduce uh, or an increased risk of COVID to them, right? Um with people who are coming into the house, could they bring COVID into your house? And I think that's a reasonable question as well. So it's not as easy for grandparents to fly from one place to another or to drive from one end of town to another. What are their exposures like? Are they at risk of having COVID and then spreading it to the family, mostly the, the adults in the room again? So these are the considerations that will make the recommendation probably a bit different for each family. One of the questions we've received is, should uh, the, the, the new parents and the baby, should they quarantine for two weeks after leaving the hospital? And vice versa, should the grandparents or family members that are coming to support or visit, should they quarantine for two weeks prior to joining their bubble? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it makes some sense that if you're, um, uh, if you're having people come into your home, that they should do everything in their power to keep themselves, keep themselves safe from exposure in the community to COVID. So if quarantine is, is a method, then that, that is not unreasonable in my opinion. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. The hospital is probably a safest place actually for mm-hmm. many of us. And when you leave the hospital, I, I, I would like the audience to know that the risk of them getting COVID being here is actually probably pretty low. And I, and I often joke that I feel safer here than, than going shopping or going to some other crowded environment. Uh, so I want people to feel that when they leave the hospital, they, they're really not at increased risk of having COVID. Um, and so really it's, it's creating the safest environment and keeping the adults, especially the older adults or those with uh, immunocompromised conditions safest themselves from getting the virus or spreading the virus. Yeah, that's excellent. I think that's a very good point. And I can tell you lots of questions were about possibly quarantine uh, before the two uh, separate family members unite. Um, And as we know right now uh, in Toronto, which many of our followers and viewers are from, there are changes, public health changes that are coming up right now. So that will also potentially impact that postpartum period and coming together with family. Do you have any suggestions if grandparents were to visit, how to do that as safely as possible? Yeah, so I think you mentioned, you know, limiting their own exposures prior to arrival uh, would be one strategy, um, washing hands, uh, et cetera, distancing from other community members. Uh, Once they arrived into the house, uh, wearing a mask would be a reasonable uh, measure, washing Mm -hmm. hands, distancing, because uh, I've heard from families where the uh, an extended support person doesn't have to be all over the baby or themselves, but can be help out a lot in, the, in, in, their, in their home, uh, whether it's cleaning or what have you. And that could be super helpful for a family. 
and I, I'm always worried about the mental health of our, our, our women, especially are having babies. And, and I think Dr. Maggi is, is more of an expert than I am, but I, I really think we have to be mindful of uh, the real risk of mental health uh, stress and disorders on women who are in the immediate postpartum period. That to me is a, a really important thing to consider and the most important thing to consider when dealing with COVID in my opinion. And I think that's a perfect segue into our next question. So let's let's move on to that and speak about exactly that. So Dr. Julie Maggi, I know you've been a little bit quiet and listening to all of us. What are you seeing in terms of um, levels of anxiety right now in our pregnant people, uh, both during pregnancy and postpartum? And because you know we know that about one in five women experience some sort of mental health condition in the perinatal period um, and studies are starting to come out that we're seeing uh, heightened levels of anxiety and distress. So if you can just speak about that a little bit and also like, what can we all do and what are some resources that we can share with our followers today? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Mogler and, and the entire panel. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm always thrilled when we um, if I might say before I answer the question, had the opportunity to think about the, the mental health impact right, you know, in the same places we're thinking about all the other impacts. Um, so, so thank you. Uh, and so the first thing I think I want to say around the, the question of anxiety is we are seeing, um, pregnant or not, we're seeing a lot of anxiety right now. Some of it, you know, I don't want to over, so to speak, pathologize it, right? Like there, we have a lot of uncertainty right now in the world. And there's, you know, a, a, we're, we're living through um, unprecedented pandemic in this generation. So, so I think we have to, first off, be easy on ourselves and know that nervous feelings, anxious feelings are also within the realm of normal feelings, right? And so, so we want to, to firstly be aware of that. Um, now that being said, uh, the preg you know pregnancy and postpartum is an at-risk time for developing uh, depression or anxiety, and in fact, as as this panel knows, it's one of the most common complications actually of pregnancy, uh, which a lot of people actually don't know. So we need to take care of ourselves and safeguard during this time. So. You know, the stress of the isolation, for example, um, could for sure be a trigger. The stress of the uncertainty can be a trigger. So we need to sort of put in place the supports that we can during pregnancy and postpartum to try to mitigate, mitigate against that stress. And I, I really liked what Dr. Campbell was saying about, you know, this idea of risk, of risk benefit really is what you were, were talking about, right? And we, we've had this discussion, I think, you know, off, off, off this panel many times about um, uh, uh, safeguarding a um, pregnant and postpartum person's mental health as well as the mental health of their, their partner and their family. Uh, and how to do that. And so, uh, you know, if somebody has, for instance, a pre-existing depression or anxiety, the isolation, you know, quarantining and isolation can actually, I mean, we don't have evidence because this pandemic has just been going on now for a couple of months, but we know from what we know about depression, that isolation and decrease in those social supports can, can have a negative impact and cannot, you know, can make it, can precipitate a depression or anxiety. So we really have to, to think, you know, like there are times when we do want people in the home helping, right? And that, that, that might be the smartest decision for a family to make. And so I always tell my patients or like, let's talk as a team about what your risks are as an individual and think about what the best thing is for you and your family. Yeah, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Maggi, do you have, um, you know, advice, not just for our followers, but also for providers, because as Dr. Methy was talking about, a lot of what we're doing now is virtual. So what can we do during our virtual visits, both as, you know, a patient or as a provider? And what are some virtual supports out there that um, we can all turn to? That's a, a great question. So, um, you know, the virtual visits, uh, so most of my visits actually are virtual because <laughs> people like the convenience of being able to, especially postpartum, right? Just be able to, to see me right there in their home with the baby on their lap, not have to travel anywhere. So the virtual visits need not be any different from uh, a perspective of checking in and talking about your emotional, mental health and well-being. So that's the first thing, just because it's a virtual visit, I mean, in fact, as I said, it sometimes makes it easier to check mm -hmm. in on people, 
and I have more appointments with people postpartum because they don't have to get themselves in. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've been able to see some of my patients a week after delivery, because even if they've had a C-section, you know, they don't have to get themselves in. It's super easy. So, so from that perspective, um, the virtual visits can be very convenient. Um, And there's actually, I find a lot of my patients are saying it's way easier to get to some of the psychological supports for this reason, right? Because they just, they don't need to take a half day out. They can, you know, log on to the virtual supports that are being offered. And most mental health providers have now initially, again, things were slow, just like with everything, right? But now most mental health providers and emotional support providers in the community and in the hospital have switched over to virtual. So, so in my experience, if there was, you know, something in the community that was being offered before in person, it's now being offered over Zoom or, you know, and, you know, public health, I know is making phone appointments, obviously they go in if needed. So I I actually think from in that regard, people are finding it easier to access success. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and not just for the mental health supports, but sort of, we skipped this um, earlier on when we were talking about the postpartum period and how that extends to other uh, types of services like pelvic physiotherapy. So it's actually surprising to many people because when we think of pelvic physiotherapy, we think of it as an in-person assessment, Mm -hmm. they're actually doing things virtually right now. Uh Um, And breastfeeding support too. So there are many lactation consultants that are doing virtual breastfeeding support. Um, you speak about the mental health support as well, but it, it's just very interesting how we've pivoted really. And perhaps the postpartum period, which has been harder to access, as you said, because it's a harder time in general, maybe is becoming more accessible. Um, yeah, I, I think some of these um, things will remain virtual even after COVID. Um, I agree. I, I, I think, I mean, I'll be interested when all is said and done and the pandemic's over and we can sit down and maybe ask, you know, our, our clients, our patients, what mm-hmm. they found more helpful about these things and keep those things, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the convenience, not everyone, it'd be nice to have some in-person things at some point again, you know, like nice to transition back. But I bet that the convenience will be something that people talk about and we try to keep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just on the topic of postpartum um, visits, Dr. Campbell, can you talk a little bit about in terms of baby care? Has that changed at all in terms of the postpartum supports? Yeah, so I think this is a a really important topic. Um, You know, if you're uh, pregnant now or if you're planning to get pregnant, uh, I think it's important to recognize the immediate postpartum period for the baby is uh, is an at-risk time. Um, And so you need to plan. So breastfeeding, which I think is a huge source of stress for so many of our families uh, and parents, you need to plan that. So find your local breastfeeding resources, uh, do your Google searches, ask friends and family, who did they use? If there's a private person, if that's uh, accessible to you or a public health team or a hospital that offers virtual program, Mm -hmm. these are important things to check in on because it's a huge source of stress. Uh, Obviously nutrition, trying to optimize a nutrition plan for your baby. The next thing would be planning visits because it's important that the baby have an in-person visit in the first few days after they go home. Uh, That's always hard for women. Um, If they've just had a baby, uh, it's stressful, it's it's exhausting, painful sometimes, but it's important to plan that because newborns are at risk of having feeding problems and jaundice problems and that needs to be done. Uh, And in fact, uh, at St. Mike's, uh, we have clinics ready to help with those uh, uh, with both breastfeeding and in-person visits. We have family physicians and we have midwives and pediatricians who can help critical um, to have those v- first visits in person uh, before we can set up a, a, a virtual. virtual. Uh, uh, right. uh, and vaccines, of course, need to be in person and they're critical. Yes. So two months in Canada is for most places where the first vaccines are done. Uh, so that's a critical in-person appointment. So so it's important to plan. It's important to have your care providers in line and your resources ready, if at all possible. Uh, but St. Mike's is here for you. And uh, again, uh, I think the experts here have actually spoken and written about some of those things. So it's, it's yeah. a great resource. No, that's great. I just wanted to stress for expecting parents that in terms of newborn care, that sort of business as, you, as usual, um, exactly. even during the pandemic, we certainly need to see your babies. We need to support you in breastfeeding and, you know, the, the issues that can be dealt um, with virtually will be done virtually, but otherwise we need to see you in person and we're there for you. Um, and that brings us to our final question. And, and Dr. Maggi, you, you were kind of alluding to this, but you know there are 
very great benefits of virtual care and we see that in terms of accessibility. But what happens to the patients who can't access it? And, and, and I'm thinking about, especially at St. Michael's Hospital, our most marginalized patients who might not have internet access or a phone or you know, come from lower socioeconomic status or have lower education. And there has to also be this technological literacy sometimes when we do virtual care. So how, what do we, what do, we do? And um, what have you been seeing in your practice? Yes, that's a great question, Telly. I, I, for sure, there are some people that um, are not able, as you say, to, to either have the technological um, literacy or the technology to be able to come in or to be able to do something virtually. So we see people in person. So I, I, you know, I think that the key that is important for everybody to know is that we meet the, this is how I think of it and how I teach all my residents and medical students. We need to look at each individual and see what their individual needs are. And if they don't have the technology or can't use it, then we will be there in person to, to see them. Uh, and similarly, you know, if, if people need help getting into appointments, there are still people in the community working to help people get to their appointments. Like those are considered essential services and they continue to, uh, to go on. And, and it's critical to ask that for every individual. Yeah. yeah. And I think basically what you're saying is those individuals need tailor approaches and probably need more consistent in-person care with their maternity care provider or their provider postpartum. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Maggi, any comments on that? Or Dr. Campbell, any thoughts about that? Well, I, th I think for me, I, I, I love the idea of um, relationships being held. You know, I, I think one of the things that makes St. Mike's special is that the people that work here, right? And so if we can offer individualized, flexible care, uh, especially for those who are experiencing disadvantage, um, we, we need to and we have to. Um, and, and that's one of the things I love about working here. Um, and I think people value that. And if you can identify in person their needs, um, and where they're able to maybe do some virtual um, access, some virtual care, you can really tailor a plan that meets their needs. Um, this is not a time, we, we already know that COVID um, is setting uh, already a difference. And we know that COVID is, is more represented in those who are disadvantaged or marginalized. And that has to stop. And part of that is structural. That isn't to do with any underlying medical bias. And, and I think we're ready to do that. And um, and, and we should. Yeah, I Certainly just, I just yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, I want to echo what Dr. Campbell and Dr. Maggi mm -hmm. have said. Um, we have such a, a diverse population of, of individuals, patients at St. Mike's. And I agree, we need to tailor our, however we do things to uh, the patient's needs. And um, whatever, like I know I have some patients who it would be very difficult to conduct a phone visit or a virtual visit, the language may not be as, uh, you know, easy for, for uh, to do over the phone. And, mm -hmm. and so I think you have to understand which patients would benefit more for, a, for you know, to an in-person visit. So there's just issues like that, that uh, we want to facilitate this for our patients. Um, and it just makes me think in general how much, you know, the pandemic has highlighted so many healthcare gaps that exist in Canada, not just in Toronto, especially for our most vulnerable populations. And we're certainly seeing that, especially in the pregnant population as well. You know, I'm thinking of some of my patients who um, need the food bank more postpartum than they did prior to the pandemic and how hard that is on a working mom with other kids having to go to a food bank. But what I've I found incredible is our social workers have been able to pivot right. too. Um, you know, so they've made relationships with some of the food banks who are actually able to bring food to the mom's home instead of the mom having to venture out during COVID-19 with her kids to the food bank. So I think we're all uh, stopping and thinking about how we can do things differently. I mean, this, you know, when you think about a simple intervention like that, that could have possibly been done prior to COVID-19. Um, but we're all sort of stopping and thinking about how can we do things better for our patients, make it more accessible for our patients. And we're thinking creatively. And, you know, I often think about COVID-19 being a stressful time for so many people, but it's also allowed just a time to stop and, and think about how we can do things better for our patients. And, 
you know, it's, a, it's an interesting time in that sense. Yeah, and I agree. I, you know, I mean, it, it's that silver lining in a cloud of, of, of you know, despair for many who are unfortunately affected by this disease. But the silver lining is the healthcare system's going to learn and we're going to learn as uh, clinicians and, and hopefully our, our patients will benefit from it. One thing I tell my residents and medical students all the time is that we're in crisis and in every crisis we can find an opportunity. And I feel like our ability to think creatively and help people better um, now and after is to me, the silver lining, right? That hopefully we will come out of this and be able to be even better than we were with the systems with which we went into the pandemic. Beautifully said. Hi everyone. So um, for this part of the panel, what we're going to try to do is a rapid fire question and answer. We've received so many important and wonderful questions um, in advance of this panel, but also in our chat function right now. So um, I'm just going to go through them and we're going to try to answer them as quickly as possible and try to get through as many as possible. So our first question that came from one of our followers was, is it safe for my two year old to be in daycare while I'm pregnant? Maybe I'll take that one, uh, Tally. That's a that's a that's a really good question and something I get asked a lot. Um, I, I, it's not an easy one to answer because, like every choice you make when you're pregnant, there's a balance. Um, so there's potential problems with sending your child to daycare because children can transmit this virus. We know that. Having said that, uh, thankfully, children are probably not as efficient as adults, and they don't seem to get as sick uh, like adults do. So there, uh, and frankly, most daycares are being extremely cautious and doing really good precautionary measures. So I don't think the risk is very high. Uh, for some families, though, the stress around that, and if they have loved ones at home that are vulnerable, may make that a hard, um, even though it may be very, very small, in fact, minor, some would call. For others, it may be a big deal. And so it's an individual choice. I think we have to talk uh, with their care provider who knows them the best uh, and really have a, maybe multiple conversations around it to see how they feel. Perfect, thanks. Um, Dr. Muffy, is asthma considered high risk for a mother who is pregnant? In, in uh, many cases, uh, we are able to control asthmatic symptoms uh, during pregnancy quite successfully. Uh, however, we do know that if you were to get COVID, there's a possibility that your symptoms from COVID might be more severe because of your underlying disorder with asthma. So I think that would require a very you know, thoughtful and careful approach to monitoring uh, asthmatic symptoms and tailoring the medication accordingly. And if uh, the patient experiences any symptoms to let their healthcare provider know as soon as possible and to be seen and, and assessed. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. What are your recommendations for seeing family at Christmas if you are due less than a month later? <laughs> I'll, I'll let a nice start with that. That's, okay. that's, that's a tricky one. I, again, I think you know, in a perfect um, setting, we should limit uh, any holiday celebration to those in one household. That's the public health recommendation. And that makes the most sense because if you do that, then you're minimizing an increased risk of transmitting COVID and acquiring it if you're pregnant. Um, having said that, there are situations in which uh, there may be um, cir circumstances that are dire and uh, unaccounted for that might, might counteract that increased risk of having another household or one family member who's protected. So again, a, an individual risk assessment probably needs to be made. Uh, in general, we should try to keep to one household though, and that's what I'm gonna be doing. Dr. Maggi, any thoughts about that? I mean, that's a good question because we're all, um, we've all been struggling, I think, through this course, this entire pandemic in being isolated. And I think, you know, again, we have to look at our own individual needs. If somebody, if I have a patient of mine, for instance, who might have a significant postpartum depression, for instance, and need to have people close by, um, then we sort of work on uh, an individual risk benefit decision around that. Um, and I think, you know, we're all being asked at this time to try to find novel ways to keep connected and be connected. And I think, you know, in most cases, that will be the case for Christmas and, not, you know, the upcoming holidays as hard as it is. Yeah, thank you. There's a question sort of related to this and um, 
it, uh, are there situations where partners are not allowed at the birth and what can we do in the weeks, months leading up to delivery to be safe? Maybe I can take that one. Um, in terms of uh, the hospital protocols for COVID screening, the screening questions that are asked at the entrance of the hospital and again at the, on the labor floor are the situations in which we would not allow a partner or essential care partner to come in. And that would be if they have symptoms themselves or that they have uh, had an exposure to somebody with proven COVID or under, you know, un being un investigated for COVID or has traveled in, in within the 14 day period prior to that. So those are the kinds of questions that are gonna be asked at the screening. And if you say yes to one of those questions, the, the central care partner will not be allowed to come in, unfortunately. Um, what was that question about daycare? So there's a question, uh, Dr. Campbell, if you could go back to this, because we asked you about daycare while pregnant. Another question is what about daycare postpartum for the newborn? So again, I think an important question, um, Dr. Manji has quite rightly pointed out, postpartum uh, time period in the first few months or longer can be super difficult time for women. Their mental health is my biggest concern. Uh, there's obviously other medical issues, but that's a really big one in which case supports for the mother might actually include having the other child at daycare. So what, what helps that woman, what, and, and Dr. Maggi can speak to this, is, is the most important. And if that includes a really small, tiny risk of having another child attend daycare while she receives other supports, if that helps her, that may be part of her plan. So I think it's an individualized risk. In general, I, would, I, I am comfortable with the vast majority of daycares uh, in, in, in healthy households. And I think you mentioned this earlier on during the panel, but the risk to the newborn is actually yeah. quite low. Um, in pregnancy might, in certain situations, if there's underlying comorbidities, might be a different situation, but the postpartum period for the baby especially is probably the risk is potentially yeah. lower. Absolutely, this risk is all about the mother and adults. Yeah, okay, great. Um, next question. Uh, let's just see, there's so many that have come in yet. Ooh, this one's interesting. We have not conceived yet. Would you recommend holding off trying to conceive until after a vaccine is widely available? Perhaps I can weigh in on that one. Uh, of course, this is such a personal decision. Uh, when do I get pregnant? When, when am I going to start my family? When am I going to expand my family? And so I think there's a lot of factors that come into play with this decision. And uh, some of those factors may include uh, what is your social situation? What kind of medical problems might you have? What are your life plans all about? How old are you? Like there are so many um, considerations to make here. This pandemic is not going away that quickly. So we know that this may go on for another year perhaps. Uh, I, I hate to say that, but we may have to continue being cautious until we can get a vaccine. So I think I, I see that as a very personal decision that you can make with your healthcare provider in consultation with them. Um, we do know that there, there is no evidence at this point that if you were to have COVID and conceive at that time or get COVID in the first few months of pregnancy when the fetus is developing, there's no evidence that there's an increased risk of a congenital abnormality uh, or an increased risk of miscarriage at this point. So hopefully that may help some of you make a decision about what's the best timing. Great, thank you. And then speaking about vaccines, I know this is um, on the top of everyone's minds and we did have some questions about the vaccine. So what about studying the vaccine in pregnant individuals? What do we know so far about the vaccine? So, I, I mean, I'm sure others have something to say about this, but I can say that as far as I've looked, um, there are no studies that involve women uh, or pregnant persons or individuals um, with the vaccine so far. So, I mean, what we do, uh, what I've learned is that it depends on how the vaccine was made and that, that we can take some confidence from the flu vaccine, for example, that we know that how helpful the flu vaccine is for women and how it and other pregnant individuals to reduce the risk of complications of influenza should they get it and decrease the risk of getting it at all. And so I think we can take 
uh, you know, some confidence from that going forward to say that hopefully this will be a safe vaccine. The COVID vaccine will be safe for, for pregnant individuals as well. Okay, great, thank you. Any other thoughts about the vaccine? We're, we can move on to the next question. There's lots coming in. Okay, next question. This is one that has come up a lot. Do I need to wear a mask in labor? Hmm. Sounds like one for me yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, we encourage uh, pregnant individuals and their partners to wear a mask. In fact, they will be asked to put on a mask at the entrance of the hospital. Um, and it is encouraged that the mask be worn during labor. And and during the pushing phase as well, unless it's just not comfortable for them to do so. And we recognize that. Fortunately, the healthcare providers will all be in their PPE. Um, and, and we understand how difficult it might be to wear a mask while you're really doing the hardest work uh, in your life when you're pushing. Yeah. Um, okay, so a, a couple more questions about the labor and delivery um, process. So one, now that Toronto has entered uh, red zone, this is somebody's questions, what changes are expected to occur in labor and delivery in terms of support people? Um, so at, at this point for our hospital, and I know that it may be different for other hospitals and each hospital will have its own policies. At this point, we have not changed our policy over the last several months since March, actually. We are allowing the one essential care provider to come in with the pregnant individual who's in labor. And um, it will, I mean, we hope that things will remain under control and that, that we can continue having essential care partner come in with our patients. Yeah. So at this point, it has not affected uh, what we're doing at the labor and birth unit. Good, two follow-up questions to that. What about a doula? Can I have a doula in addition to my uh, partner? Um, and then the next question is for Dr. Campbell. What about the NICU? If my baby is admitted to the NICU, what are the policies around support people? For the doula, I will have to say that only one essential care partner is allowed um, in hospital at the moment. And so we cannot have a doula. And uh, we realize how important it is to have a, a support person but we're only allowing one at this time. And just to add to that, if they choose to have the doula as their support person, they then can have a doula. It's just that the policy is having just one support person at a time. That's correct, Tom. And the doula would go through the screening as well. Yeah. In, terms, in terms of the NICU, uh, we're fortunate at our hospital to have two uh, uh, people to be able to attend the NICU as long as they are well. Um, you know, uh, to, to help support each other with their baby in the NICU. So two partners are allowed. That's not the case in the vast majority of hospitals. And so it's important uh, to be aware of, of policies and procedures in your local organization. But we are very fortunate here and, and fingers crossed that stays that way. Great, thank you. There have been quite a few questions about the postpartum period in terms of blended families and how to mitigate the risk and how to navigate that. I feel Dr. Maggi needs to answer something. Do you want, do you want to try that, Dr. Maggi? I can try that one. So I think, um, you know, I think this one goes back to uh, the two concepts, two first principles. One first principle of uh, what we're dealing with in the pandemic and that we need to, we all need to continue to work to, to, to mitigate our risk and so mitigate our exposures. Um, and that being said, the other first principle, I think in this postpartum time is that it is very hard and you will need some support around you. So my advice would be to connect with your healthcare provider, whoever that might be. And so it could be your family doctor, pediatrician, obstetrician, psychiatrist, uh, and talk about what the most important issues are in your family and make some decisions around that. And then, you know, if you do have blended families, you, you might even decide to have periods of isolation so that you can come together for the support that you need. So, um, so I think, again, always go back to those first principles or what are your needs for your own health and the health of your family? And then what are the public health recommendations at the time? That's great. Um, Julie, maybe we can ask you another question now that we have you. Um, <laughs> How can we support new moms who might be experiencing a deeper level of fear, anxiety, both personally and in terms of baby safety during this time? And, and 
Another question related to that is what tips do you have to keep anxiety at bay during pregnancy during this time? Yeah, those are very good questions because we're seeing, look, everywhere, pregnant or not, we are seeing people right now who are a lot more anxious and a lot more distressed. And if you look at all the curves of like psychological coping in a pandemic, we're actually, we're at the low part, but we're hitting, you know, we're hitting the next stage, the next phase of this pandemic in the midst of already being at a low part. So not to be kind of, you know, the doomsday person, but I, I say that because this is the reality and we want to, um, we want to understand that and not over pathologize what we're all feeling. Right. So um, the ways I think that uh, we can help each other at this time, again, are going back to those. I'm all about first principles, going back to what helps you as an individual when you're feeling nervous. So what's your toolbox of things that help you and help you get through and help you be resilient? And this is actually the time to take the time to activate those things. So get things in place in terms of social supports and that might not be in person, but it might be over Zoom, right? And then there's a lot of, I think we mentioned this a little bit in the course of the webinar, but there's a lot of um, supports in the community that actually might be more accessible to people now because they are offered over Zoom and virtually. So talk to your provider about getting hooked up to those. That's great. And I think we only have a few minutes uh, left. And I know there are many questions we have not been able to answer. I'm hoping that perhaps we'll, we'll be able to send sort of blast with some sort of common questions and answers. Because um, these are very good questions. I think if we haven't been able to answer these questions, I really do encourage you to speak to your healthcare provider. Also on our Instagram account, Pandemic Pregnancy Guide, we're constantly getting direct messages and answering them as much as possible. So please feel free to do that. But I think just to end off with one uh, last question, and somebody asked this question and I loved it. What is the most important thing that a pregnant mom can do to prepare right now? Um, so to our panelists, any, anything that comes to mind that you really feel would be your one thing, or maybe it's a couple of things, obviously, um, to help our followers right now. I, I would just, uh, quickly just add, you know, do your best. Think about what keeps you well, do your best, know that you have support. The healthcare team here at, at this hospital and others are ready to help you. Um, it, it's a concern to have COVID, but pregnancy is an amazing time. Uh, we're going to help you through it and you'll get through it. Very wise words, Doug. I would say um, that, yes, we are here to help um, as a, as a person who's been also, you know, have, has children and has been through not a pandemic like this, but um, I think just being prepared, I think understanding what helps you to uh, just deal with the, the everyday issues during pregnancy, getting your support people in place, having a plan A and a plan B if things do change because they might uh, in terms of COVID exposure and that type of thing. But I, I think that planning ahead uh, is, is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Great. Dr. Maggi. I would second and third what uh, Dr. Campbell and Dr. Matthew said. I think this is... Um, you know, we're living in extraordinary times that keep on going in this way, but, um, you know, largely what we see is that uh, pregnancy and postpartum, like there, you know, there's some differences in the ways you get care and that, but the, the care is the same and getting COVID is still thankfully and, you know, for in pregnant people rare. Um, and so I think getting the things in place that you need for the pregnancy and postpartum to support you, to my mind, that is one of the most essential things. And in some ways, don't be too distracted by all these other things. Like you can focus on the pregnancy and the supports you need and ask us because we have been through it now and we are here to help you. Thank you so much. So we're gonna wrap up there. Um, just before we end this panel, I'd like to introduce uh, Robin Fowler to give a few last words. Wow, thank you so much to Dr. Campbell, Dr. Mefe and Dr. Maggi for sharing your expertise and experience and giving us so much useful and comforting information. Thank you to Dr. Bogler for acting as our moderator and navigating through all the questions and answers. And thank you to Carrie O'Reilly Wilkes for sharing the story of your experience at St. Michael's NICU with Malachi. 
We always love to hear stories about the remarkable and compassionate care moms and babies have received from the staff and physicians at St. Michael's NICU Maternal Care Division. My name is Robin Fowler, and I'm the Vice President Philanthropy Strategy and Campaigns at St. Michael's Hospital Foundation. We're really excited to tell you about how we're going to change the future of maternal and infant care when our state-of-the-art NICU maternal care space opens in the new Peter Gilgan Patient Care Tower. Our NICU will have the world's gold standard of care. It will have obstetrics and gynecology, neonatal intensive care, and a recovery unit all on the same floor, and private rooms so moms don't have to be separated from their babies. And it will have full families fully involved in caring for their infants with experts nearby to teach and support. This campaign is important because it is helping those who don't have a voice. Mothers from marginalized communities and babies who need all the support they can get from their community. Unfortunately, for exactly these reasons, this is a particularly difficult campaign as those who need this care the most do not have the champions that others might. If you're interested in finding out more about how you can help, you can go to stmichaelsfoundation.com slash NICU or contact Justina Jonka at jonkaj at smh.ca. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a great afternoon.